piece of wood is different. The sound, the feeling, the hearing, and the look of it. I guess it would be like turning a page in the beginning of a story to shape it out. Each shaving it falls. There's a page, there's a page. I guess it's proof there what your mind and heart can do. It came to signify the Northwest Coast. And so if you wanted a memento, that's what you wanted to have. The business community was very interested. And when Stanley came from Denver, he had seen the pole. It wasn't terribly far from the shop on the waterfront. He was um, a fisherman. He traveled a lot from Canada to the States. Of course, there's no real visible border, I guess, with, with, our, with our bands. A number of Nuzhalnuth people lived down on the Duwamish Flats. There was the possibility that the children could go to school here. There also were ways that one could make money, particularly picking hops. Sam Williams found that the curiosity shop was interested in having somebody carve totem poles. My grandfather was one of the first to sell artwork to the old curiosity shop. I mean, we have a long history with them. And he developed his own style, which is very different than the northern styles. You can look at the noses, uh, the way brows, there's certain characteristics. Bulging eyes, a certain way of making claws, the positioning of the mouth and the shape of it, very large teeth often that were flared out. We put shape on our teeth because at the time we were the only ones that uh, rounded our teeth. It appealed to Stanley. Stanley had several of his poles in his yard over in West Seattle, and he stored them alongside uh, the wall where the uh, cars would come up to go on the ferries. Then he began to encourage also making small poles. These are good examples of Sam's work. You see, he would call this easy money. So you can see that these are a little bit older, but this would be a good example of what he would make a bucket of these up and sell them for 25 cents. You can see the William style. It's evolving here. Um, the frog is a good example, the way they carve their feet. Through the poles that were carved by Sam Williams, then by his children. An old tradition was reinvented in a new way and that tradition became something in its own right. My dad was born in December of 1933 and about 1936 he was three when he started carving with my grandfather at the Duwamish River where he sat and carved. It changed in 1950 to 1960 where my dad took my granddad's work and added to it. To me, it's like watching him carve and it's like he's cutting butter. It was just effortless to see him put a knife through a piece of wood. He created a genre of his own, a style that became unique to him.
Raymond was born lucky to be born into a family of artists. And he knew, he knew that his children would be okay and would be able to provide for themselves if they could carve. So they carved. I, I remember talking to dad and he said every single generation adds a little change to the totem poles. And he said we're definitely in this generation, um, we've added a lot more detail. I know there's 250 designs. The stories behind them, I know very little of them. Um, the last person that I'm completely aware that has the histories and the stories of our totem poles is John. John, like his older brother Sam, had a special ability to take the craft and the, and the style of carving just a little step further. John and Sam, they're like Batman and Robin. They pressured themselves to keep the art alive, to keep moving forward. To them, it was just, it just came, it was like second nature to them. They could just sit there and uh, take a piece of wood, doesn't matter what it looks like, and uh, it just comes out amazing. He started when he was seven years old. That was the tradition in their family. And by the time he was 10 years old, he was carving totem poles and, and masks and things of that sort. To see the things he'd created. You no, know, everybody in the family carves like it, but to watch him carve from the beginning to what it looked like, you know, he was talented. And um, I think the, per the closest person to dad because he was always there with dad. Doesn't matter where he was going, like to the States or Canada or where he was going, John was always sure to be there. John Tay was very loved by his family and certainly loved by those of us that came to be his family. John was one of the people that came into the club regularly when we were located on at 165 South Washington. He had so much personality and he always had just a wonderful aura about him. His smile, his personality, the voice, how he walked. He was a kind of, he'd give you his last dollar if he had it. You know, I don't know, just how little things people take for granted about. Dad passed away, then Sam, then Dave, then Nathan. My brother, my brother just fell. He would get tell about his father dying, and I remember he'd cry. He'd start getting really. Um, and then when his brother died, yeah, there were some. He would he would hit some hard times. When um, Sam and see Sam and Dave are are buried here in Canada, and um, when he left Canada, he did tell me and. Um, a few other people, he said, I'm never stepping foot, foot back in Canada. And he, he never did. He never came back. He never returned. I know that his, the alcoholism had, had really hit him hard, but he just kept being a survivor on the street, and he would, I would see him when I'd walk downtown. We all saw the deterioration. And, but he, you know, he never lost the smile, he never lost that friendly chuckle. He never lost the ability to laugh. I hadn't seen him since 1989. And I had reconnected with Rick in 2006 about, and uh, we, we talked a lot about John and, and how to find him. It wasn't really clear where he was. Mr. Williams, you see that symbol right there? Yeah. What does that mean? Walk. You see that symbol right there? Don't walk. Next time, look up and you won't get stopped. Okay. Do you understand that? If I, yes. see, if I see you do that again, I'm going to do what well, listen to Welcome. me. Listen to me. Williams. This ends my 
my contact with Mr. Williams, one of our regular mental transient Native Americans. I'll be turning the video camera off now. I know a big part of John's struggles was there's very few of us left in, in Seattle and he was missing a lot of us. My mother actually sent my brother Eric to Seattle. He, she, she said, go get John, he needs us now. My brother Mike and I found him. We were sitting in the market and um, I seen him and said, hey bro, he didn't, he didn't hear, he didn't um, acknowledge me until I got about this close to him. The street life really hurt him and he sounded like a child. He was standing there looking at us, Rick and I. He goes, man, I haven't seen you two sit together in 50, over 15 years, man. You're so happy to see both of us. Must have been August 30th. Eric and John and I were at Victor Steinberg Park. We call it Native Park, but nice day out. Just telling me he's losing his sight. You know, saying he's embarrassed by it and could barely hear you. I had to get this close to him and had him take my hand in sign language to say, I'll teach you how to carve the way we saw Grandpa. To see that smile of his and saying he wanted to continue, because if Grandpa can carve blind, he can. And okay, I go get my stuff. I made a dollar out of my donation hat. I said, "Hey man, I got a buck, man." I handed him a dollar. You say thanks for looking out, brother. Walks up the street, looks back. Two hours, I'll be back. And... No, at that day and moment, I, I, I couldn't get it, I couldn't see it. He's just walking across the street. He was coming back to us that four point something seconds he had. So right as I, I had crossed the street behind the police car and right as I stepped up on the curb is when the, the gun started going off and um, about two car lengths into the parking lot I, I stopped and turned and John was staring right at me and I saw the blood on his shirt. Three or four minutes after John was shot, you know, it spread like wildfire. Somebody came from Born and Howell and told me they just murdered my brother and I set my carving down and then after that everything went upside down. I'd been out and about during the day. I came in about four o'clock, sat down, turned the TV on, it said breaking news. The horror of it, and all I could do was sit there glued to my chair. I could not move. I 
was at my son's soccer practice carving a totem pole in a park and somebody came up to me and said you better not do that in Seattle you could get shot for it and I said excuse me. I was stunned stunned and dumbfounded and I just could not believe. Well I found out the day after and I was just devastated. I mean I was I was in such shock like I don't remember phoning him I don't remember phoning my my son um, and telling him about it and yesterday shortly after 4 p.m. Uh, SPD patrol officer Ian Burke confronted a person armed with a knife at the corner of Boren Avenue and Howell resulting in the use of deadly force I knew something was really wrong. I didn't know, you know, why somebody was shooting a gun off in broad daylight. And I just wanted to go, but it was pounding in my head. I needed to go back. And so I got about a block and a half away. I just, I finally turned around and came back. And um, at that point, there was a police officer at the other end of the block taping off the street. And I stopped and talked to her and, and told her. A lot of information that was provided yesterday and throughout the day, it just keeps ever changing as we as we talk to witnesses, as we talk to officers who were there. Had a knife? Yeah, he had, he had it out. He was uh, carving it up, carving up that board with it open. I approached him and the tool instructed him to drop it multiple times. He wouldn't do it. Good job here. He said my boy's going to attack over there. He was in no shape of attacking. It would take me 25 minutes to walk. It would take him 50 minutes to walk, 60 minutes to walk. He didn't introduce himself. Just yelled at him, hey. Hey! 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 Put the knife down! It became pretty apparent uh, that day, and particularly in the, in the next few days to come, that Things were not quite adding up. I'm all right. He had it open. I asked him to drop it multiple times. He was carving up that board. He kind of turned towards me. I have to tell you at this point that um, I have a lot more questions than answers. I, mean, I could go on and a two-day span of minute by minute what I saw and. Oh, it, it gathered momentum, not only in native country, but in all, all areas. Everyone at that point was, was um, reacting to this tragedy. Am I in danger? I mean, like, look at, I'm an artist as well as him. I, I did sit alongside with, I do carving. I'm nervous about going back there again. This is just kind of the tipping point after there have been so many other, other incidences that were similar. Oh, there was incredible anger. I mean, the anger the first couple months was, was evident. You could touch it. It affected a lot of people. You know, there was a police officer that is supposed to be sworn to protect us that you know, really gunned somebody down in the street that uh, was making no threat to him whatsoever or anybody else for that matter. Um, for me, it was as if when the gun went off, um, there was something inside of me that just almost collapsed. I'm like there was, it was almost as if I died right along with him. There was a lot of anger and a lot of protests on the streets and Rick was calling for calm, a calm response that would honor his brother. Okay. Listening to people angry, yelling at me. Homeless rights advocates, Indian rights advocates, there's you know, the, the anti-police brutality folks, whatever he did trying to maintain the peace, he got grief for it and, and felt that pressure. I hear people saying that I should say something. My heart won't. Ian Burke had been two years 
on the force or two years on the street. He had completed his training. And he thought that it was weird that a Native American would be walking down the street with a, a knife and a piece of wood. It shocked me that it was not ingrained in this police officer that Native Americans have been carving in Seattle since before it was Seattle. And that totem poles, and in particular this family, are part of the fabric of the city. And it, I was shocked and angry that, that he thought this was weird. Even I carved in Seattle when I'm walking down the street, right? I don't take a moment to just relax. To me, it's always carving, right? To me, that's relaxing. I mean, that was the one thing my dad always said, if you're gonna fight, you know, never use this. This is, these are, you know, your livelihood, right? Your knives, right? Your wood, that's your livelihood. Don't ever use that. The Williams boys were magnificent carvers, but they were also very used to carving in public. I would see them walking down the street carving, and I once asked them, Aren't you worried the police will say something or do something with your knives open like that in public? And John said to me, I remember it very clearly, he says, all the, all the police know who we are. I knew John T. from when I worked patrol as a young officer in the 80s. Um, and that's the other thing is that a lot of officers knew who he was. Um, and I think most officers, particularly senior officers, knew um, that, you know, there were times um, that, you know, he could be problematic, but for the most part, um, he just did his thing. So the inquest was a long process involving the very difficult testimony of eyewitnesses and others who were involved. And the jury was not really instructed. There, there were questions that, are, that the family wanted to ask that weren't asked. Um, there were some legal standards that we wanted to have applied, but there were no legal standards provided to the inquest jury. So, so they were given some questions to answer. But what the validity of those would be and how they were judging them and what legal standards they were applying, they got no direction on that. King County has really strange and unique inquest rules that are different from other uh, jurisdictions in the state. And it, in the 40 year history of this inquest process, there had never been a finding that the police had done anything wrong in the shooting or in a death. And so the cards were stacked against the family getting any sort of answer or justification or feeling that they were being heard and that their loss was being acknowledged. So when the jury reached a decision that was sort of half and half, it, we, we saw that as a victory because they were acknowledging that there were questions about what Ian Burke did and there were questions about whether he really reasonably believed that he was in fear. And we were, of course, skeptical that he was. So, Ted, only four jurors said that they believed that Williams posed an imminent threat of serious physical harm at the time he fired his weapon. Only 50% of the jurors. Um, that is hardly a definitive finding exonerating the officer. Well, what that goes to show, uh, four didn't know. And of course, what we have is a situation where they're being asked to look at this in retrospect with all of the information that's available now that was not available at the time. And I think the jurors very clearly were taking into account the fact that Mr. Williams was highly intoxicated that day. My brother was deaf in his left ear. Could barely hear. Could barely see. Where did he have the time to react? Prosecutors have to decide now whether to charge Ian Burke with the crime. What do you say? I have no idea if they have any interest in that whatsoever. I think under state law it makes it very clear that uh, they have to overcome a pretty serious burden, basically show malice on his part. Today the county prosecutor, Dan Satterberg, decided not to bring criminal charges against Ian Burke for the shooting of Mr. Williams. I understand the frustration and anger that the public feels. They rightly want to know if Ian Burke is not held accountable for his actions, can any officer be held accountable?
The Firearms Review Board has reconvened and based upon extensive review of the evidence and witness testimony, they have concluded that the shooting was not justified. In fact, what we have unanimously concluded is that John T. Williams did not manifest, did not complete the predicates for the use of deadly force by putting himself in a position to imminently cause death or serious bodily injury to Officer Burke. From the family's perspective, um, at some level, it was like he got away with murder. And so again, Rick, was in, Rick and the family were in the position of, well, what do we do about this now? Right? How, do we, how, do we handle, how do we handle a system that doesn't hold someone accountable this way? You know, we understand there are legal theories, there's process and all that, but at some level it, it felt very um, uh, empty. I do remember him the way he was as a kid till now. I don't want that image in my head of his last moments anymore. There had been a lot of stories about his brother in the press that were um, really hard. You know, you'll see some of the outrageous things my brother did. And all they said was the last week of his life. Rick was hurting in a bad way. Uh, having to relive the shooting of John over and over and over. I knew that the best thing for him would be to get back to work, to put a knife in his hand and just like his dad would say, get to work, boy. The idea was propagated that we're going to carve a totem pole for John. I loved that idea. I said, oh, my heart was got feel, feel full. I was really happy. I was really, like, I was happy there's something going to be there for, for John because regardless of, you know, what happened, like, and I don't want it to be, like, sort of a memory of, like, the shooting. I want it to be a good memory of John, right? Because that was John, like, he was a carver. That's what he'd done all his life. Dan Martin had, had arranged with Kellen Mankey at Mankey Lumber to donate the tree. Um, so we drove down to Shelton and met with some members of uh, the Squaxin Island tribe. That was their territory. I'm standing in the forest picking the log with Danny and I. It's like the tree called us. And it was a big, beautiful cedar. Um, and we, uh, we prayed around it. And then uh, the loggers went to work and, and took the tree down. The logs were loaded on the truck. The truck was driven up to Seattle and we just kind of caravanned our way all the way up there. It was pretty amazing seeing that, that huge piece of cedar uh, coming into the Seattle Center. Set it down and to see everybody blessing the tree at that moment and peeling the bark back, putting JT on it. And that's about when the images started showing me how big the eagle will be, the master carver and the raven would look that I saw it as the bark was coming off. The more I took off, the more I could see it come to life. It'll mean something, and that's what we were after. Started at March 15th at the Seattle Center. The key people that were here in the beginning at carving: Dennis Underwood, Danny Martin, Paul Williams. You know, we asked other carvers to come by because they knew my brother. And Got this far with what little tools we have: patience, a good sense of humor, a good crew. The biggest thing we ever did. I think as a totem pole carver, a model totem pole carver, I think you dream of doing the real thing, the real deal, like playing a video game and wanting to really race a car. It's different. So you have to learn. 
we're we're looking at where they got everybody got tired at the end of the day after 10 hours we got tired or like whoa so we gotta go over it again and make sure it's even before we get into this here the detail of the animals right well it's a huge commitment to stay at the pole and carve you know there was a, a core of people down there that carved all the time Times it was 10, 12 hours, 14 hours a day I'm down there carving on it. You want to do that up to here and then start taking this part out here to get the shape of that whale. Mm -hmm. The way my granddad did it. Mm -hmm. For your brother, man, that's a lot of love. Of course. Brothers forever. I was always thinking about what they did to my brother and my thoughts just started staying with this here because I found it healing me instead of having all that anger in me. And you know, by the end of the day, I said, well, I did a great job today and what I was after. And it's all coming to the way I'd like to see it in the tradition of my dad and granddad. Let's set the, set the little one that way as far as we can, and let's just see what we got. Okay. At the end of the month, we moved to Pier 57. I'm home again. This is my other carving spot. I've been in this park like 20 years. I used to sit on the steps. I sat up there. My dad and brothers and I sat in that, where those benches are there. That's when I found out how heavy the log was. Originally, the log that, uh, that the pole was carved out of weighed 12,500 pounds when it was hoisted onto the truck. From 12,500, it went down to 4,500 pounds. OK, that'll work. Coming down to land it. When they set it down, I mean, that lit literally scramble my marbles, how much weight we took off by all that pounding and shaping. I feel it after 12 hours a day since March 15th till now. doing the rain dance. Not me, it was him. <laughs> <laughs> when they first moved it down there, I was worried about leaving the attention that we had generated at the Seattle Center and, and trying to redirect down to the waterfront. But the foot traffic and the crowds who showed up because, you know, the Seattle waterfront during the spring and summer is a beautiful place to be, was amazing. And I don't think we could have been in a better place than we were down on the waterfront. It's really been uh, a vehicle for, for positive interaction with, with human beings of, of all flavors. <laughs> and Rick is, is, is wonderful in, in bringing everybody to, to the table like that. Rick was being the sort of P.T. Barnum of the Pole Project and he was engaging the public and telling John's story and telling his family's story and letting people carve and, and doing little mini classes. You put a log in front of me, I'll show you what my people are about. The students I have here and to see such young people interested in learning the, something about our heritage of who we are as carvers, to see what we're doing here. I feel my grandparents, my dad, my blade brothers, gives me the strength to keep going forward. Oh, yeah.
think of all the different ways that Rick could have reacted or the community could have reacted. You know, who knows how, what would have been burned or, or destroyed, but instead this community, and the Native community in particular, but also the wider community, came together in a way that, that uh, embraced healing. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. It was very helpful for me also. I was there when they brought the logs in and um, actually had my son with me. He went, went in up there with me quite a few times. He actually showed me a little bit on, on how to carve and, and just, just spending time with him. To see so many people come tell me what happened to their child. There was um, four, of, you, them, if, four if, of them that if, were killed. If, if you ask if you have to be sleeping east to west and ask the old ones, show me. The question was asked, what kind of warrior can you be? Are you going to be the fighter, the one that goes out and hurt? Be that warrior that's inside that will give you all the strength you need to do even what we did here. If you can't forgive them, how are you going to forgive yourself? Rick was constantly repeating to me, stay strong, and he told me that. Every single time I saw him, quite a few times, he kept telling me that, just stay strong, stay strong. I'll ask the prayers for you, okay? Just be strong, don't let go. Just have the great memories of you, know of them. Keep that alive, then they'll be at peace, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I really don't want to see anybody else go through this. There are, I think, folks in the community that would have preferred Rick to be more radical, to have been more outraged, to have taken a different stand. Um, what he did was to try to build bridges with the department, to try to build understanding. Peace. <laughs> right? Rick was a central figure of peace during this entire time. And for me, I was, ab I was absolutely amazed by that because I knew how much he was hurting after a while, you, you quit hearing anger and hate. You started to see the people really admiring and thanking us for taking such a terrible thing and giving something beautiful and positive back, you know, that could have went the other way, but in my heart that we did the right thing by staying calm. That guy's going to join us. Next day, Huey shows up. I didn't know who Rick was. I didn't actually know anything behind other than what was in the paper. And Rick asked me if I would like to volunteer. And I said, well, what better project? It's saying something. Something needs to be done. He's doing a super thing for his brother. And I like working with wood and I enjoy seeing something come together. See every little grain go where it's supposed to. up something new. Being a part of that totem pole, he sat there with a piece of sandpaper in his hand and sanded that whole totem pole, all 34 feet of it. And we'd carve on it, and he'd come back and sand it again. Hugh most accurately represented the people that always found a place within the Williams family that gave their lives meaning and comfort and joy and purpose. I loved the family unity that was there. Part of the message of the project and the people who gravitated toward it was of hope. Quiet. And the idea that even if you were down on your luck and hadn't carved in 20 years, you could still do it and you would be welcomed.
you could come and just be there and be part of this community of carvers and weavers and share your thoughts if you knew John or if you didn't know John. You had a home there. When it started getting cold, Victoria Schoenberg of the Seattle Parks said, you know, you guys want to wrap it up? And Rick said, no, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay here till we raise it. Even though he might have only gotten one or two people stopping by on a rainy day, he was still down there. Uh, we saw a lot of rain, snow, and, um, and the only thing that was in mind is, I want you to see and feel the heartbeat that we all put into it. All the emotions. I was constantly burning sage to keep the energy pure because when it stands, that it'll be like a magnet. You got something bothering you, go sit with it. Bring a book and sit down and read. Be part of it, you know, hoping it'll help heal. Because that's the biggest thing I wanted out of it is that the people will feel what we all put into it. We had a 3,000 mile limited warranty to every um, the last week, running around, uh, looking at what they need to touch up, a straight line here or a dot. By then I was physically drained. I, my son Dunhart took over. It was the first time in my life I couldn't cut a straight line. It's, I guess because the days just went by so fast and, you know, for five months stressing on it, waiting for it, and when the day came, well, that's all we had to do is sign it. We're almost there. Knit Nat, my tribe, dated February 26, 2012, and then peace sight at it. I arrived there and uh, Rick was telling me what needed to be painted. I'm like, oh, okay, so I went and grabbed Nancy. You guys need help painting? Okay, I'm on it. She looks like she knows what she's doing. Uh, Shut up! <laughs> I'm happy for you on the stage. Uh, uh, really proud for I you. I can feel my brother too. Really proud for you. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> we, had, we had all discussed as a board uh, and a community to carry it traditionally um, up to Seattle Center. It's like a mile and a half to carry this pole that weighed, by this point, we were estimating weighed about 3,500 pounds. I don't know, I don't know, everybody's... Oh, everybody's got a different idea. Yeah. Everybody's got a different idea. We've heard it, we've heard three of them already. So we'll, we're gonna try plan A, and if that yeah. doesn't work, we'll yeah. do plan that's, B, that's and what if I that think. one doesn't yeah. work, we'll do something else. Well, it's gonna get there. It's gonna <laughs> get there today. It's gonna get there. And I said, okay, just humor me. Can we put a sign-up sheet somewhere to make sure that we have enough people? And they all just laughed at me and said, we're gonna have enough people. It's good to see you. Uh, we had no idea that a half hour before we were scheduled to carry it, there might have been 50 people down there. We, we were not gonna make it. And in 20 minutes, the waterfront was covered with people. It's just one of these things in the Native community. Everybody has this faith. You know, we plan in a general way, and then the, we always trust that the details will work themselves out. And they always do. They just always do. changing the way things are. We were lucky enough to where um, a dear friend and brother of mine, Sidutz Peel, really walked us through what was what was going to happen that day. You guys want to carry it even together, and it, was, it looked like a very good lift. I was eating breakfast in the morning because I didn't think they really needed me, and, and they called me and said, where are you? We, we want you down here. So I, I rushed down there. And it ended up in a miracle, you know, and being there, and I was honored, highly honored. One, two, three. Okay, straight forward. And it came up off the ground for the first time, and people were just cheering and drumming. And 
as the totem pole started walking slow. Hey Rick, totem pole's on the road, buddy. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, brother. <laughs> to see it move up western. Woo! Look at those faces in the front! How fast it was. I quit counting after 90 people there. It was hard work. It, uh, it was it was tricky. It wasn't. It obviously it's not something you could rehearse. They're moving faster than I thought they would. But it took 120 of us carrying that pole and guiding it through the streets of Seattle and another hundred or so people walking alongside chanting and drumming and singing with us. It was a healing experience for us. Um, you know, we had a lot of officers out that day who were part of the traffic control, the motorcycle escorts, all those type of things that you know, in their comments to me that day and after was that they were really proud to have been down there for that. It really, you know, boosted my confidence in the department of, you know, where our officers are in, with their hearts and, and recognizing, you know, the harm that had been done. wasn't without its bumps in the road, but it, it uh, I don't know, it was a beautiful thing. I'm really glad that we decided not to just use a machine to bring it up there and pick it up with a crane. You guys ready? Yeah. One, Do this. two, three! <laughs> in with the blocks! To see the fast-paced walk, dude, I had to get over to the side because they were really booking it. As far as I knew, everybody who was going to be there was walking with the pole. And when we come out, came up over the hill, and there was standing room only in that whole section of the center, it was pretty amazing. Get the totem at the center and sit down and. Um, when the pole arrived, it was. I, it was an emotional experience. of the people were there, that everybody. When it arrived, I just, I had goosebumps. Andrea came hurrying over to the tent and gave me this huge hug, and we were both in tears because it was such an emotional thing. It was like, an amazing amount of energy was released on that day for all of us. It, it really struck home to me what a community effort it really was, that we all played a part in it, every one of us. We did this, we did this, the community did this, not I or I, this company, or I. That we all put our hearts and mind into this project to get it done. Coming up. Oh! Oh! It was a day of um, really deep feeling and emotion and sense of connection to the community that made that happen. Ready to stand. From my 
past as a childhood seeing one of my granddad's totems growing up. And all I saw was the history of saying the same thing in the Williams family standing and seeing the different tribes come together here to be part of this. And the only thing I remember that moment is giving a rebel yell and I saw my stick in the air. And I guess that's another time I left Dobbs. What do you think, kid? To see it going up, I was like, wow, Rick, you did it. The people listen to a thought that was about the most powerful energy I felt. This is going to speak louder than I ever will. Oh, 
Very good. 